Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I'm Margaret Lowe. I'm president of Atlantic Live. It's wonderful to see such a packed house this morning. This is clearly a topic of interest, and I'm here to welcome you to the Future of Prescription Drugs, a Forum on Assessing Value in Drug Prices. It's clearly an opportune moment for this conversation. Politicians on both sides of the aisle have found at least one thing they can agree on. The drug pricing system is broken. And today we're going to talk about models for reform. One idea that's getting a lot of attention is value-based pricing. In a typical value-based program, a drug company promises to pay an insurer a larger rebate if the drug company's medicine does not improve a determined indicator of patient health. If the medicine does work, then the insurance company accepts a smaller rebate, leaving the drug company with more revenue. It's an, it's an interesting concept and one that, not surprisingly, has sparked debate. And this morning, we're going to hear that debate play out as industry leaders, health economists, patient advocates, and other stakeholders talk about the pros and cons of value-based pricing reforms. A few practical notes before we get started. We want everybody to silence your cell phones, but as we like to say, don't put them away because we'd love you to join the conversation on Twitter at Atlantic Live and use the hashtag AtlanticRxValue, AtlanticRxValue, up there, all one word. And you want you, we want you to be part of the conversation in the room, too. We're going to be uh, uh, asking for your questions after each session. Uh, importantly, before we get rolling, I want to take a moment to uh, thank our underwriter, Eli Lilly and Company, for making this gathering this morning possible. We're very grateful for Lilly's support. Now. In our first session, we'll get a primer on how the drug pricing system works and why it needs fixing. Please welcome Johnson & Johnson's Vice President for Global Health Policy, Liz Fowler, Henry Aaron, a senior fellow with the Brookings Institution, and Gail Walensky, a senior fellow with Project HOPE, that's short for Health Opportunities for People Everywhere, an organization dedicated to finding solutions to health problems around the world. And now, please welcome my colleague, the Atlantic's Washington editor-at-large, Steve Clemens. Good morning, Margaret. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. What are you doing here so early in the morning? You must have a burning desire to know which way the price of drugs are going and, and why they're going there. Uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. I hope we can have a, a, a chat to sort of demystify the question of how you know, drugs are, are priced and how it could be done in a better, a better way. And I thought I would just start with the fact that I have to do a lot of these 8 a.m. calls, you know, these 8 a.m. meetings that Margaret Lowe organizes. Uh, and we come in and show up, and, and I try to be smart and swift. And, but I, I know, I hear that there's a new drug that Lily is producing that will make me even better and make everyone better out there. And, and I want to ask Henry Aaron, if there was sort of this new drug, like the 8 a.m. miracle drug that was coming onto market, that was whatever, how in a value-based world would you get that drug priced right? Henry? I think you've asked one of the hardest questions there is. Uh, and to drive home the point, I'd like to start with a simple, purely hypothetical, numerical example. Mm. Uh, let's suppose a new drug is developed that will be a benefit to 10,000 people a year who would, without the drug, die with certainty. With the drug, they will survive, on the average, for an additional 10 years. Mm. The drug cost, and this is not uh, far from actual cost, a billion dollars to develop, including all the tests. Each dose costs $1,000 to produce. One dose works in each of the 10,000 people, and it's under patent, and it's going to last for another, the patent's going to last for another 10 years. Now, you need one additional bit of information to do value-based pricing, and that is to know what the general accepted estimate of an additional year of life and normal health is. A lot of argument about that. For simplicity, $100,000 a year. Hmm. What is a fair price for that drug? It costs $1,000 to produce each dose. Remember, the knowledge, it's 8 a.m. The knowledge, the knowledge, <laughs> that's the only reason I'm doing it. If people are sharp in the morning. Uh, Some. Uh, it cost a billion dollars to develop, and somehow the drug company needs to recover those costs. And the value to each person who receives that 
is a million dollars. Mm. 10 years of life worth $100,000 a year. That incidentally is the key piece of information that undergirds what's called value-based pricing of drugs. What is the value to the user of the drug? Now, I think choosing among those prices is the challenge for deciding how drugs should be priced. And my own view, for what it's worth, is that it would be an outrage to charge people a million dollars for that mm. drug. A thousand dollars is certainly not enough because the drug companies need to recover not just the cost of production, but also the costs of development. Somewhere in between is what a, I think is a reasonable cost uh, to charge for the drug under current arrangements. Now, mm -hmm. we could change the arrangements and have the public, the government, right. help fund development costs to a greater extent than they now do, mm -hmm. and that would change everything. But I would just like to pose that numerical example as a challenge no, I mean, to I, all I of think us that's a fascinating what the price way to lay out the equities. But, but Gail, you, how, you, would, you, how you, would you come in? Well, you, the, uh, I think that Henry has posed a very interesting question about value, value to the user. Is that, is that really what you want right. with regard to the pricing? The only minor qualification in the example that he didn't set up, but I know, I assume he'll agree to, is that it's not just a question of having the drug company be able to recruit the uh, total cost, yes. but it's of all of the drugs that never make it all the way through that process. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, there are really three complications on the production side that you have so to worry about. So can I ask you, you know, how many drugs on, on, on a cost basis of say one to 10, where you've got you know, an aggregate amount of, of money and investment in drugs and you're getting returns, how many sort of bad drugs or ineffective drugs or decline drugs way down the system on, on say, but a percentage basis? It's not that they're, it's the drugs that never make it from the time they are being thought about right. in the lab to actually make it to market because right. they fail at some point or they fail in clinical trials. What is, I've been surprised is there have been in the last few years a number of highly touted drugs that have failed in their uh, last phase mm. clinical trials. Uh, which really is a very expensive problem for pharmaceutical companies when they have gone all the way there mm -hmm. uh, and then they blow up. I, I think the number of those that start off as a germ of an idea and actually get to market, one so out of ten, one out of eight. So Henry's picture because it's siloed just around that drug. It wasn't just that. It was just really to make the point right. that on average, you have to have companies be able to recoup the development they place in the ones that never make it, as well as the one that makes it. So it was saying, I agree with the issue that he set up. Uh, it's just slightly more complicated. Uh, and when you look at rates of return, or uh, return on uh, invested equity, or however you want to look at the capital that's expended, it really has to be to try to think about comparably risky Mm -hmm. industries. It's not the only thing you right, want to think right. about, but if you either you change how you fund the development of drugs, as Henry uh, indicated, having more public involvement, we can debate whether that's a, that right. will be more productive or not. Right. Um, or you have to recognize that it becomes a question of looking at the return on invested equity in high-risk drugs, including the or in a pharmaceutical area, or other places that people right. can invest their money if you want to get this kind of continued production right. of drugs that Thank like the hepatitis C drug Thank that actually cures. So Liz, I want to ask you, you're, you're at Johnson & Johnson and I've been interested in the, in the patient's place in this equation and how when one thinks about the drug industry and pricing, mm -hmm. when you begin to think about both value and patience and that part of the equation, how does the old pricing model need to change from your perspective? 
Well, first I want to respond to a couple okay. points that were made earlier. And but then make sure you answer yes, my question. Yes, <laughs> answer your question. This is Washington. You don't yeah. have to do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so to the question, first of all, it, it, is pay, it, it is the funding, the innovation that doesn't quite make it uh, to the finish line as well as future innovation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, I can't speak to how other companies price their products, but um, at Janssen, Johnson & Johnson, as we think about pricing a new product, we think about value to patients. Mm -hmm. um, how does it, what does it represent over the standard of care? This new 8 a.m. drug, um, is there anything on the market today? Um, is it, you know, how does it compare to what's out there already? Um, the value to the system, um, mm -hmm. is it gonna prevent a hospitalization? I doubt it in, in the case that you've outlined. Um, but, but looking at sort of value from across the spectrum, um, we think about access as well. So in, um, in the comments that Henry made, um, thinking about um, you know, how are insurers gonna pay for it? Are they gonna pay for it? Um, do we have data that shows that, that it's economically um, um, relevant and important product? And uh, what, what, um, what are patients gonna be asked to pay? So we think about patient access, and I think that's where patients come into our equation. And then that last piece is um, funding future innovation as well as, mm -hmm. as past innovation. And I will say, we were one of the companies that had invested over a billion dollars in an Alzheimer's drug that failed. Um, so we were, mm -hmm. you know, we've seen that up front, and that, was, that happened the first year that I joined the company. So very relevant, um, very relevant issue. So with all due respect, the process you just talked about, to me, sounds incredibly complex. And I'm sure yes. pricing is incredibly complex. And you're dealing with uh, a health and care insurance system and, and what we've now learned as there's been more and more focus on the ecosystem involved with pricing, that it's not just the branded drug or even the generic front face of the drug. There are all of these other, you know, back PBMs and other players that are involved in uh, adding costs. Um, <clears throat> I've spoken to Heather Bresch, uh, who's the uh, occasionally controversial CEO of Mylon uh, with EpiPen, and she said, you know, she's advocating right now for a lot more transparency that people, that patients, when they go, ought to know what the prescription price is gonna be, that there ought to be more transparency in the system. Do you think, I mean, what I just heard you say is great, but I don't know how you would achieve transparency in that. Is that a goal of your industry? Or are you better off with things obfuscated and blurry? <laughs> <laughs> well, when you question. put it that way. No. Um, well, well, first of all, I, um, if you haven't seen it, I would recommend going on our website. We have put out a transparency report mm. and tried to explain the best we can a lot of the factors that go into how we think about drug pricing, how we think about access, um, and I think a number of companies are trying to do the same thing. So we would like people to better understand how things work today, and so that's what we tried to do with the report that we put out um, at the end of February. Um, and you know, transparency, I guess, um, to whom? And, and one of the issues that, that we um, have been talking about is, you know, there's, there's a difference between the list price and the net price. And the list price is what everybody sees, um, a lot of outrage about the increases, um, but the list price is not um, what is actually paid. We, we rebate and discount that price and arrive at a net price. And I think describing that, um, that dynamic is something that we're trying to do. Um, I think one thing that's concerning to us, and maybe one, one aspect that um, Ms. Bresch is raising is um, the co-payments that patients pay. Is it based on the list price or the net price? And what we're finding is that a lot of times it's based on- well, Those co-pays that people are, 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 have been paying have been, have been rising dramatically, like the, the, the early payments. So they're, the, they're, their sensitivity to prices is felt more on the front end of the, of the pricing structure. Am I wrong? You're not wrong, and we're very sensitive to that, and we share patients' concerns. And is that concerns. your fault, or is that the insurance company's fault? So we don't set uh, co-pays. We don't decide what um, patients pay when so they go. So the insurance go, company's the bad guy in this. Well, I don't look. I don't want to pay, point a finger, and I, I think it's actually not a productive way to have the conversation. So no, I would not point the finger. But I think there needs to be more of a dialogue and a better understanding of how the system works. It's extremely complicated. I think the industry sees one part of it; the payer sees another, um, and Patients, I think, have um, not necessarily been part of that equation and, and probably should be, um, should be brought into that conversation as well. Henry, they, who's the bad guy in the equation? I'm not going to say who's a, a bad guy in this situation, but I do want to go back to the numerical example I gave mm -hmm. because I would like to apply what uh, the principles that were just uh, right. laid out. Um, here we have patients who will die 
If they do not receive this drug, they will live for 10 additional years worth $100,000 a year. That's a million dollars. Uh, if they receive the drug, they face a co-payment. Beyond that point, they face no charge at all. Hmm. Uh, and even if they're already at their stop loss level right. on their health insurance, they don't even pay the co-payment. Hmm. So um, the drug company that has produced this drug worth a million dollars to people who are going to pay whatever the co-payment is or less have an open tap on cash from the healthcare system. The question is, what price should they charge? Now, if they're thinking of their shareholders, they may behave like Martin Shkreli, which I think most people in this room would not endorse. I don't think you would, I'm pretty sure. Gail wouldn't either. But uh, the question is where in that million dollar range, above or below, they're not paying anything for these benefits, mm -hmm. so uh, the insurance, broad insurance system is paying for them. How do you price that drug? I think this is one of the most vexing questions, uh, and it leaves a vast range to management discretion, management ethics, uh, and uh, poses an enormous public policy problem uh, for the healthcare system, for insurers, and mm -hmm. for government through Medicare and Medicaid, who have an enormous influence on how drugs get paid for. Henry just yeah. raised implicitly uh, two points I, I'd like to elaborate on. Uh, in using the Martin Shkreli uh, example, uh, or the Mylan uh, example, those are cases where it's not, Mylan's more complicated because of the mecha injection mechanism, but particularly in the, in the other, um, these were not protected on patent. It's mm -hmm. actually a different problem. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem if the government wanted to be more pro proactive, it could. Uh, if you get a small use drug that is off patent, generic, and you have somebody just uh, increase the price in a, uh, an extraordinary way, right. you could imagine a world in which the government actually pays a competitor to come in to be a second producer uh, although what we have seen happen, frequently not surprising, is tremendous pressure on the individuals who act in such an anti-social way. It's one market when you have something on monopoly. And one of the challenges that goes on in new innovative prescription drugs mm -hmm. is the government is granted a monopoly. Now they do that because if you don't have intellectual protection, you're not going to have the investment so that you have a chance to recoup it. But once you grant the monopoly, then, and if it's really a monopoly, there really isn't a competing drug uh, like Henry's ex example, um, then you have this dilemma that the monopolist could behave in a not very socially consumer way, thinking of very short-term profits. Generally, Companies have longer term views. They know, first of all, the government can find ways to get you when you behave uh, in antisocial ways. And that this is this year, but they're worrying about three years, five years, 10 years down mm -hmm. the road. And so typically don't want to grab all of the consumer surplus in us economist terms that is generated, not all of the value or in their than, pricing, or more, more than. than. We, we, we could do a whole college course on this, and I want to <laughs> break out of, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of this, but I, I'm really interested in how we move from where we are now into something more healthy uh, that takes in. One of the new, one of the new discussions is on, well, better information. One of the discussions is on value-based pricing and how to get that right. Communication, when you, you know, talk both about the efficacy of drugs, that kind of circle uh, of information of looking at how drug industries work with insurance industries and look with patient outcomes. That is something that's being looked at, I know at J&J, at &J, but also in other, other firms out there. And, and I'm interested in whether or not that might be a compelling alternative uh, as a framework. Uh, and Henry, I know you don't necessarily think so, but I'd like to hear for Gail for a minute whether or not that represents a real alternative to kind of all of the problems that you were just describing in these kind of you know, incumbent monopolists, and you know, I get all that. Yeah. But but if you're going to move into something new, what would that new infrastructure begin to look like? Well, for me, uh, something this is an issue I've discussed actually with Johnson and Johnson about ten years ago. Comparative effectiveness research. 
would be enormously helpful. That is showing uh, who, what kind of groups benefit uh, relative from taking from one drug or another or an intervention versus a drug, a surgical procedure versus a drug. And how would you have that affect price? Um, well, the question is, the, as a payer, if it doesn't do more, should you pay more than the going market? When it does more, that's when it becomes more complicated of saying, yes, you can justify a higher price. There's no great gui guidance about how much. The real question in my mind is, who should pay for the comparative effectiveness research? It will take two or three years after an FDA drug approval until you've got enough market experience so that you can say, yes, this drug is uh, significantly better, modestly better, 3% better, or, or no better than the existing drugs that are out there. Mm -hmm. and for me, that's the easy case. You can be out there, but there's no reason to reimburse at a higher rate. Uh, right. it, and because there are competitive products, you really don't have uh, this real monopoly. This we do a lot of that research, actually, but a lot of it we're not allowed to talk about with payers. Um, there are certain restrictions on what information we can share and what information we can't. So Why? Um, <laughs> well, that's a good question. I think under certain regulations, um, you know, the information that we produce and what we can share, if it looks like it's um, marketing off-label, for example, um, or going beyond what the label prescribes, then we've got to be really careful about that. So. Um, so I think, but we do a lot of the um, comparative effectiveness um, data and research now. But do you think that that inability to communicate creates an impediment to a more successful system that needs to be reviewed? I, I, I want to, I mean, if you were to take a shot at the FDA today, what would you say? Well, first of all, we support the FDA, okay. so, so I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not. Definitely so we, we, A lot of right. FDA people in the audience were right. thrilled. Financially so, as yeah. well as in principle. Well, under the User Fee Act, yes, yes absolutely. Right. So, so first of all, that's one impediment. There are a lot of impediments that, that prevent us from going down this road. I think we'd like to do more in the in value-based or outcome-based um, innovative contracting arrangement space. Um, what we can share is one impediment. Um, some of the other rules, for example, the current um, best price rules, ASP, the average sales price under Part B. If you look at our system, we have a regulatory system that was built to service a fee-for-service environment. And as we're trying to move into a value-based system, I think you've got to relook at some of those rules and see, you know, maybe revisit some of them and, and figure out what's working and what's not. But but let me also say that, you know. The Affordable Care Act and MACRA after that mm. was intended to move our system towards value. And I think the industry wants to be part of that conversation and is looking for ways to be part of that conversation. So um, so I think it's good we're having this conversation today. I think in, that's exactly what we want to do. In the last few minutes do. before I go to the audience, which I want to do, Henry, I want to ask you about the kind of turmoil and the, and the storms around the Affordable Care Act uh, and, and the failure to repeal, the failure to whatever, whether that uncertainty out there in that system matters to this discussion or not? Or are they just completely different? Is the ecosystem of drug pricing and how we're um, seeing that evolve disconnected from these largest ma larger macro questions on, on healthcare policy? I want to follow the previous procedure. I'm going to answer a previous question, then I will answer <laughs> yours. Uh, the previous observation that you made, Steve, was uh, is uh, value-based pricing of drugs the answer? Hmm. The force of the numerical example I gave is a firm, no, it is not, because it leaves a vast middle ground within which actual drug pricing is going to occur, mm. and you have no guidance, really, as to where within that range prices should be set other than managerial discretion, mm. uh, some very inexact science, because this is not an area where we know the, the numbers that go into the equations. Uh, and the, so I think this leads me, at least, to a judgment that in the end, as drug development proceeds, and I fully expect miracles from Johnson & Johnson mm. and, and other drug companies over the coming years, I mean real, do you have miracles coming? Yes. Real, okay, real trans <laughs> things that are going to transform it's what it means to, to live a normal human life. Right. I mean, it's really profound stuff that I think is going to come. Uh, I think there's no way to avoid uh, the involvement of government, of public regulation, 
of this in some form, whether it is to bear part of the cost of development uh, and testing right. to make those public costs rather than private costs that have to be recovered mm -hmm. by the producers through higher prices, uh, or whether it's simple pr uh, price regulation that is going to come in some form. I don't really know. I stressed I think it's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the ACA story, uh, we're in the midst of a very chaotic uh, process. Uh, personally, I was skeptical from the beginning that the repeal and replace effort would succeed. Uh, it doesn't look very likely that it is going to succeed, but who can tell? Mm. Uh, it's anybody's guess. This was an attempt, the ACA, for better or for worse, to bring a kind of order into the uh, insurance market that didn't previously exist. It was the culmination of decades, one could say almost a century of effort mm -hmm. uh, to reform the healthcare system. If it fails and crashes, if it is uh, replaced completely, I will say destroyed, it will make it, I think, impossible uh, to bring the kind of coordination <coughs> of policy to health care for a very long period of time. I am not suggesting that... And that, that includes the prescription it drug includes, industry. It includes... Yeah. It's going to have all kinds of ramifications beyond the particular law itself. It's going to cast a shadow over public involvement in uh, all aspects of, of health care policy. Uh, I'm not suggesting the Affordable Care Act is uh, a perfect act. Few people who support it do. And I'm not suggesting that measures that would correct flaws that I might see have a chance of being enacted without recognizing the views of those who are generally opposed to the Affordable mm. Care Act. It's going to have to be a compromise process. The unfortunate aspect of the current debate is that there is so little indication of a willingness mm. to negotiate a compromise package of improvements and changes to the Affordable Care Act that I believe could give both parties something that they want. And I think that's something right. that uh, Gail would probably agree Gail with it from and, the other Liz, side. Just as we wrap up here, because we just have about 45 seconds each, um, if you were to be super empowered and to be able to move the needle on any aspect of a more healthy pricing system within it. What would you think are the most important pieces to move? Just short form. Uh, first of this comparative effectiveness research, knowing what works for whom, when, under what cir circumstances, is incredibly important as a backdrop. I have a little more confidence in the competitive pressures that PBMs mm. can have uh, with regard to the uh, very strong pricing, pharmaceutical the benefit. pharmaceutical <laughs> benefit manufacturer, thank you, that are the large I love large how healthcare group. has become so much like Pentagon talk. Yeah. <laughs> the large purchasing groups yeah. that are very effective, and we saw this especially in the hepatitis C drugs. Uh, uh, once you had AbV come on in the market, uh, the Savaldi Harvoni price dropped significantly. Right. Um, I'm a little skeptical about uh, having the government get in there uh, with regard to the pricing. Henry was very careful of saying how you do this uh, is, um, uh, uh, is hard. Uh, mm -hmm. It is maybe in the development, maybe more in terms of the sponsorship. Uh, the government has never, at least HHS, has never negotiated a price. Uh, it sets prices. Uh, when it sets prices wrong for uh, physicians or hospitals, it can fix them right away. Right. The problem, if it screws up in the pharmaceutical pricing, mm -hmm. you'll know it 10 years down the right. line. Liz, you helped sculpt this policy, and now you're in the private sector. What needles would you move to get a better better pricing system in place than we have today? I mean, I guess thinking about ACA and, and the value-based pricing conversation that we're having, access to continuous coverage and access to coverage, I think it's really important. And if you look at one of the barriers to investing in, or if you want to look at it, in, investing in therapies that might be more costly is, you know, you might not have those um, those enrollees at some point in time in a very mm. near future. I mean, the, so, the, so the more people have access to coverage that's continuous and 
um, consistent, I think, um, furthers um, the ability to do value-based pricing and, and make those investments in the sort of therapies that help people in the way that we want to help people. Interesting place to end. Let me open the floor for comments, questions. Yes, right there in the back. Can we run a mic there? Anybody else need an 8 a.m. drug? <laughs> Hi, thank you all for being here. Tara Hayes with the American Action Forum. Tell us Forum. who you are. Tara Hayes, American Action Forum. Um, my question, Dr. Walensky, um, you mentioned in a Daraprim Turing um, type scenario that one solution could be to have the government actually pay for a competitor to come in and enter the market, um, which is very interesting, but it raises Two questions for me. Um, one, what should the government pay? Um, what percentage of the cost maybe should they cover? Um, and then on the flip side, you know, the reason they've entered the market is because presumably in that situation, it signals that the government believes the company is charging too much, which is obviously a subjective um, point. But so then what right. should that company that they've now paid to enter the market, what should they be allowed to charge? And should they have to pay back some of that money that they were given? And can I just piggyback on your excellent question? When we talk about drug pricing, one of the things I have learned from reading vast amounts of material in the last week over this is that you've got the front drug, but the question is what all's in that price? So, you know, if, if Heather Bresch is saying an EpiPen, they get $274 out of a $600, there's $326 that's another part of that, that price that's out there. So I'm just, I just want to sort of look at whether we're looking at the holistic price, meaning all the component pieces, or we're looking at what just the you know, front end piece of that, which that particular drug company puts out, because I think that's a legitimate part of the question. But go ahead, Gail. The, um, the example I gave was is in a relatively limited case where you are not talking about breaking patents, because I mm -hmm. think that's a very dangerous road to go, go down. Uh, but in the case where you have a generic that is a very small market that has been ignored by everybody except one producer, uh, you could have basically the threat of government will subsidize a second producer to come in on this limited market on the generic side, on the generic side for these very limited, spectacularly bad actors that we've heard about in the last few years. So as a company buys a drug, you know, 10,000, 50,000 users, but very important users, uh, long off patent, it I would hope is, that, is that could that work? Because as I understand it, there's a huge backlog of generic approval right now. Well, that that's another issue, and one of the things that uh, that FDA uh, needs to do, we'll see, because of the 21st Century Cures Act that was just passed, that mm -hmm. put in more money in both NIH and uh, FDA, whether that helps get rid of the generic backlog. Right here. Can I say your name? Yep. Hi, Mike Miller. Um, can I sit? Is that all right? Um, I'm a longtime health policy physician. I've been working on these issues now for almost 30 years, and I appreciate Henry Aaron's uh, numerical example. I'm a longtime fan of him and Gail and all you guys. But I think that's really a, an economic retrospective look at, at how the investments work and how analysts look at it. For companies, it's a prospective thing. Mm -hmm. And they're working in a highly regulated, complicated, multi-chain environment. And my experience and insight is that they set prices like every other industry to maximize their net income. Mm -hmm. And they set the prices as best they can. And, and like a lot of other right. modeling and projections, they get it wrong a lot. So to think that you know, there's a mystique out there, the company set a price and they penny, you know, nail it down to the dollar and it's exact and it, it's you know, a perfect uh, right. assessment um, isn't true. Um, so. I think we need Mike. to be careful looking at, it, at current income as paying back investment in R&D. It's the current income pays for future R&D. It's not like they've got a banker they've got to pay back or, or the guy's going to come break their leg. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So we're right at the end of the session. We've got to end. But I want to um, take just a few seconds of each of you either in response to Mike or your final thought on what we can do to sort of improve the game. Liz? I guess I'll say I don't think it's always set to maximize profit. And, and maybe if there's any Wall Street analysts out there, then, then maybe I'm going to cause other problems. But there is, a, <laughs> there is a, a, an aspect of access. If you're setting prices that um, nobody can have access to the drug that, or, or that you're going to impact negative your reputation or you know 
companies are really in it for the long run. And Johnson & Johnson's been around for 130 years and intend to be there for another 130. We've got to think about a lot of other factors besides just can we maximize the profit in this one case for this one drug, you know, for this one time, because you've got to think about sort of a number of other factors. So Thank I guess you. I disagree with that. Thank you. Henry? Uh, I'm glad to hear what uh, Liz just said, and I believe it is true. Every drug uh, company executive wants to go home at night and sleep well and feel that he or she has served the public interest. Uh, that said, uh, they also do have to serve mm -hmm. uh, shareholder interests, and those interests are not always aligned. Right. Gail? The question is going to be, how do we mimic the effects of competition? Uh, in an area where the government needs to grant a monopoly on some of the most important drugs. Uh, these are hard questions. I think you saw the three of us struggle with trying to be specific how you weigh off the upsides and the downsides uh, of direct government intervention in an area that requires uh, uh, innovation. I want to thank Gail Walensky, Henry Aaron, and Elizabeth Fowler so much for helping us struggle through these issues. They're obviously highly consequential uh, that so many people have showed up uh, yeah. this morning here, but I think also uh, it's, it's really captured national attention in terms of how this evolved forward. So thank the three of you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Henry, Liz, and Gail. Next, I'm pleased to introduce a session produced by our underwriter, Eli Lilly and Company. It's called The El Evolution of the Value Conversation. For that, please join me in welcoming Lilly's Mark Nagy. He is Vice President for Global Patient Outcomes and Real World Evidence. Mark is joined by Gregory Daniel, the Deputy Director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy and Eleanor Perfetto, Senior Vice President of the National Health Council. Mark. Uh, Margaret, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, it's great to be here today and it's wonderful to see so many folks in attendance and wanting to learn more about this incredibly important topic. Uh, first of all, I just want to take the opportunity to thank The Atlantic. They have been a fantastic partner in terms of underwriting, in terms of organizing this event as well as a previous event that was held in late January that involved two dozen stakeholders, experts, and healthcare advocates in a, in a free flow discussion, if you will, that helped lay the groundwork for today's panel discussion. So thank you very much to The Atlantic for all your, all your help and all your hard work. Listen, at Eli Lilly and Company, this is a very serious topic. In the organization that I lead, we have health outcomes research scientists that work with our development teams in the earliest phases of development, beginning to ask questions about how do we best represent the value of our medicines? And as Liz mentioned, what are the right comparators? What are the right endpoints? Who are the target patient populations that are gonna benefit the most? And at the same time, for some of our products that are currently available, we're beginning to experiment, working closely with partners across the United States in terms of actually developing outcomes-based contracts, if you will, or value-based agreements, where as mentioned, we pay less if the drug works better than expected, we pay more if it doesn't meet expectations that we set up initially with our payer, or our insurer partners. And so this is something that we take very seriously and we're very excited to help underwrite very important conversations and discussions such as that happening here today. Now, to continue on with our discussions and um, these important topics, we'd like to broaden the conversation. And so I have the good, good fortune of um, two colleagues here that we're gonna have an opportunity to hear from today. First is Eleanor Perfetto, who is the Senior Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at the National Health Council, which plays an incredibly important role representing patient advocacy groups across the country. Eleanor is also a professor, a professor of Pharmaceutical Health Services Research at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. We're also joined this morning by Greg Daniel, who directs the DC office of the Duke Margolis Center of Health Policy. And Greg also teaches at the Division of Pharmaceutical Outcomes and Policy at the University of North Carolina's Eshelman School of Pharmacy. So I'll start off our brief panel this morning with a question first for Eleanor. So Eleanor, I understand that the National Health Council has done some innovative work to help patient advocates bring the important patient perspective into conversations with payers and with others with regards to value and how value can be defined. Can you tell us about what some of those initiatives have been, uh, what you're working on currently, 
And what are some of your hopes and expectations for the future in the area of, of value in pharmaceuticals? Of course. Thank you, Mark. Um, and again, thank you to The Atlantic and Lily for continuing this conversation. It's, it's a very important one. Um, as you mentioned earlier, we're an, an organization of advocacy groups, and um, our members actually represent 133 million people in this country with chronic diseases and disabilities. And of course, the issue of cost is very important to them. Um, and especially with this era of growing out-of-pocket costs, it's become very front and center for our membership. Um, but uh, to that point, value is what they want. Um, and that value to them means that their doctor is uh, getting uh, is making recommendations to them, and they're able to get the treatments that their doctor is recommending, um, and, and then it's good quality care. Um, the, the, the concern for the patient community has been that when the value conversation has been happening in the past, patients weren't at the table. They weren't part of that discussion. And that's been changing. That's been changing a lot, especially over the last couple of years. And in, the late, 20, uh, late, in late 2015, we began what we call our value initiative, and that is to help our membership become more involved in this value discussion. So under that initiative, we have a number of different activities that are going on. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to tell you about all of them, even though I would love to. I'll tell you about just two or three of them. The first is what we call our value rubric. And it is something that we released a year ago. You can take a look on our website. If you Google National Health Council Value Rubric, you should access that pretty easily. And basically, it is a listing of the characteristics that we recommend our membership looks for when they are looking at a value assessment or a value framework to look for whether or not it was done from a patient-centered perspective. And so it lists things like when the question that that assessment focuses on, when that question was formed, were patients engaged in helping to form that question? And are the outcomes that are, serve as the endpoints for that evaluation, are they the outcomes that patients care about? And, and it goes into other characteristics that, that, that they should look for. It's a tool for our membership, but it's also a tool for people who are doing work in this area in terms of value frameworks and value assessments. And we encourage them to take a look at that rubric. A companion piece to that is something that we put together that we call the Get Ready Checklist. And, and the reason why we wanted a checklist was because patients really, um, our patient groups were asking us, how do we get involved? How do we do this right? How do we get ready? We want to be engaged, but we don't know how. So we put that checklist together for them. In addition to that, we've been doing a lot of educational programming because patient advocacy groups don't know a whole lot about economics. Some of them do, but not all of them. Economics and qualities and things like that. So we've been doing some education on that so that they can actively participate and be engaged. Um, for the future, what would we be looking for? I think we envision um, th that these discussions will, will take full consideration of the patient's view when it comes to the definition of value and assessing the right kinds of outcomes because they're important to patients. Eleanor, thank you very much. I, I think as we continue with our discussions today, it's an important reminder to all of us that every discussion about value ultimately has to start with the patient. And what does it mean for the patient? And what does the patient value? And we can't lose sight of that. Okay. Greg, I'd now like to turn to you. I understand that you've been leading a project that's looking at some of the ongoing challenges as well as the opportunities with regards to widespread implementation of value-based contracting, if you will. Could you tell us more about your work? Uh, what have you learned? What have you seen so far? And then what are your thoughts about the future in terms of what might be needed or, or required? Right. Thanks, Mark. That's a great question. Um, I'll start with the latter, so where, where all this is going. Um, I think the healthcare system as a whole is making great strides, moving more towards value, away from volume and intensity. Um, unfortunately, those strides haven't been made in how we pay for drugs, devices, upcoming gene therapies. Um, and as uh, the previous panel pointed out, there are a lot of real barriers to doing that. Um, uh, regulatory barriers like um, you know, Medicaid best price and the way um, uh, price is reported, um, and a kickback statute, which uh, uh, is, uh, makes a lot of sense for fee-for-service type um, arrangements, but can be a significant barrier to more innovative ways that uh, manufacturers can partner with payers, um, as well as providers who are taking on new alternative payment models to get to value. Uh, and there are real practical challenges to setting up contracts, to sharing data, to doing more real-world evidence and linking that to the way that drugs are paid. Um, so what the Duke Margolis Center is trying to do uh, through our new consortium, which is actually launching next week, um, is to identify what those real barriers are, uh, but more importantly, to get the group working on significant solutions. 
So we have a group of um, uh, manufacturers, both on the drug and device side, as well as gene therapies. Uh, but it also includes large and small payers, uh, CMS, um, and patients and large provider groups. So it's, a, so it's a, an important group of all of the major stakeholders. And we're going to be working with them over the next year and beyond at really tackling what those um, challenging issues are, but real practical solutions uh, to move towards value. And the second piece of it is um, within Duke, we have a tremendous um, uh, ability to do um, research across Duke with DCRI and the School of Medicine mm -hmm. uh, and the School of Law and Public Policy. And the Duke Margolis Center is working across Duke with those departments and schools to um, set up pilots. Uh, that's one thing that we can do with this, um, this consortium, which is to do pilots to test how these new innovative um, contractual arrangements might actually get set up as well as uh, result in better value. Well, listen, thank you very much. The, the points that you make in terms of the, the challenges mm -hmm. are exactly what we're encountering as we try to go about and shift much more towards a focus on value and getting paid based on the value of our medicines. So this is incredibly important work, and it certainly, re it certainly also recognizes that it's going to take multiple stakeholders coming together to work through it. So keep up the well, good work. It is a lot of work. It's complex, but hopefully we'll make a big difference. So, so let me take the opportunity. We've only had a couple of minutes together, but again... Very briefly here, again, we've heard that any discussion about value ultimately has, has to start with the patient and the incredible importance of the patient's perspective and what the patient values most. We've also heard here briefly this morning of some of the significant challenges that exist. And, and fundamentally, we have a system, as mentioned earlier in this morning's panel, that was built for a fee-for-service model, and there's a tremendous amount of work ahead of us, many stakeholders, as we hopefully can shift to a future that's focused much more on paying for value. So let me take the opportunity to thank both of you for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Gregory, and thank you, Eleanor, and thank you again to Eli Lilly. Um, we've just been hearing about the importance of the patient role in this conversation. Now we're going to talk about more about how drug prices impact patients, how value-based model might change that experience. And for that, it is my pleasure to introduce Tanya Winders, President and Chief Executive of the Allergy and Asthma Network. She's here with Alan Balch, CEO of the National Patient Advocate Foundation, and they're joined by Susan Denser, an expert on health policy and the CEO of the Network for Excellence in Health Innovation. And here, oops, sorry about that, and here to lead the conversation is the Atlantic contributing editor, my colleague, Alex Wagner. Hi, Alex. Hi. Hello. I love that there's like this appetite for early morning drug pricing conversations. <laughs> Makes me happy about this country. Okay, so let's get right to it because I have a lot of questions and I'm sure you all will have a lot of questions. We're going to open up the floor for some audience Q&A. I'll give you a heads up, but think in the back of your minds about the questions you want to ask. This esteemed panel. Um, Susan, let's start first with a sort of newsy angle on this subject, which is the uproar over Sovaldi's pricing. Uh, Gillian has justified the charging more than $1,000 a dose for its hepatitis C medication, arguing it, that it would be more expensive for patients to treat hep C on an ongoing basis. Is this fair? Fair, right? <laughs> That's the question. Uh, is the argument legitimate that there are offsets to uh, drug consumption? Of course. Uh, if drugs work, if taken as prescribed, uh, if they result in the uh, outcomes desired, then you will see people be healthier and they will probably need less health care. You get into all kinds of complexities over what is the timeline mm -hmm. along which you recoup uh, that investment. Uh, and that was where a lot of the argument was around uh, the hep C drugs. I think everyone agrees those drugs are important cures. Everybody agrees we should get those drugs to the right patient at the right time. The question is really, uh, at what price? And is it, in effect, affordable, not just for an individual patient, but for society? That is really the question around drug pricing. Alan, where does it leave patients? I, th you know, I think it's a challenge for patients. Obviously, you have, I think, as we were talking about before we came in, the reality of the U.S. healthcare system is there's a certain group of patients, I guess I should preface my comments by saying, 
The type of patients we work are predominantly low income with an average household income of $23,000 a year, household size of, size of two, which puts them pretty well under 200% of the federal poverty level, which if you know sort of public health data around at what benchmark to pay, most patients need some form of subsidized assistance, it starts at about 400% of FBL, thus the, the, the threshold for subsidies in the marketplace exchange plans. So sort of setting that out there as a, as a preface, I think there's, in the U.S. healthcare system, it's all very expensive, whether it's drug prices, whether it's a couple days in the hospital, whether it's surgery, whether it's, whether it's radiology. There's a certain group of haves and have-nots in this country if you're going to run a healthcare system based on sort of a semi-private marketplace, right? So there's going to be a group of patients who are sitting there at that 400% or lower of the federal poverty level who aren't going to be able to afford the U.S. healthcare system, and you're never going to be able to bring drug prices down far enough. For so that group of patients, you know, there is the higher the price is, whether it's a drug or whether it's surgery or, or whatever, without some sort of subsidized assistance, they're not gonna be able, even if they have insurance, they're not gonna be able to access the system. And thus we have a safety net mm -hmm. that's in place to try to help fill that gap between what they can afford, even with insurance, and what the US healthcare system costs writ large. And insurance for most patients actually plays a pretty important role in protecting them from the actual cost. So Milliman just released a cost of cancer care study that followed breast cancer, uh, lung cancer, and uh, colorectal cancer patients over four years using actual market scan data. So this is in the employer insured market. And it turns out the average cost to the system, so to speak, of those three diseases, you know, in terms of the total cost, ranges from about $110,000 to about $300,000 over a period of four years. The out-of-pocket exposure for the patient and what's encompassed in their benefit design ranged only from about $6,000 to about $14,000. So there's a huge gap between what the plans pay for and what the system pays for and what patients are exposed to. And that's the purpose of insurance, is to protect patients from that gap between what you might call the, the price and what patients out of pocket exposure to. But that $14,000 is a big, there's a big difference between what that out of pocket burden is to you as a patient if you're making $28,000 a year versus $160,000 a year. And I don't mean to suggest that patients that make that kind of income aren't suffering financially, they, they do. And oftentimes they're not eligible for the, when they need it, right. they're not eligible but for still, the income But still, if you're testing. proportionally talking about a share yes. of income. It's regressive. Making... The pricing is regressive because you're gonna pay the same 20% on your hospital bill or your drug copay if it's a specialty tier or 40% or whatever it is, whether you make $100,000 or you make $20,000. So I think that just p puts another burden and challenge on the system. The more expensive the healthcare system gets, the harder it is for the person, the population that is low income it, their ability to afford it and even use their insurance that they have becomes far, either further out of reach without some sort of subsidized support, whether it's Medicaid expansion, which we know that's not really happening no, uh, very yeah. well, whether it's a low well, We don't really know what's happening right. with that, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but to get back to the sort of patient perspective, Tanya, so um, Peter Bach at MSK Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, his research shows that premium, the, the premiums pharmaceutical companies earn from charging substantially higher prices for their medications in the United States compared to other Western countries generate substantially more than the companies spend globally on research and development. So are patients not correct in thinking they are paying too much for their medications, life-saving or not, here in the United States? Well, I, I think it's all about you know, who defines value. And in the eyes of a patient, value and the worth is sometimes quite different than that in the eyes of the industry, mm -hmm. manufacturer, certainly in the eyes of the payer. Value is subjective. And what something is worth to you is subjective. And so I think that patients' perception is, yes, we're paying too much for our medication. We're paying too much for our health insurance premiums. Again, more than 30% of working Americans are now on high deductible health plans and are being subjected to those list prices of products. So of course they're frustrated. They're paying more in premiums. They feel as if they're getting fewer benefits. And in fact, they're paying more out of pocket for their healthcare cost each and every day, whether that's in their pharmaceuticals, in their hospital stays, more of that burden is being bared by patients. Well, let's talk about what value means, okay? Because there are a lot of variables when it comes to drugs, Susan. Um, when you talk about uh, whether a drug works or not, I mean, how do you define that in terms of value? Given the fact that some drugs may work over the long term, some may be short term, some drugs may get you to a place where you can get 
a more costly treatment ultimately that could save your life, but won't be less expensive in the long run. So let's talk a little bit about working. Well, I think what we have to do is start with what is in the drug label, right? Because in effect, drugs get approved for specific indications and based on clinical trial results. And so that would be the narrow definition of working, right? Does the drug perform as it did in the clinical trial? Right. Now we know the whole world of real world evidence suggests that sometimes the answer is yes and sometimes the answer is no, right? So it's a more complicated question than, than, uh, than to say simply if it, but everybody's you, going to achieve the results. Do you think that in performance the clinical in clinical trials should be a sort of bedrock part of how we value a drug? Well, that's what we, I mean, that's what we have to agree on, right? Because that's the basis on which we approve drugs and let them onto the market. So I think we have to start there as a definition of working. What, but I mean, to come back to another point here, which is about the prices and US patients. As Alan said, keep in mind, we pay more for everything in our healthcare system mm -hmm. than the rest of the world does. We pay higher hospital prices. We pay more for our doctors. Everything is at a much higher price level than the rest of the world. The difference with drugs is if we pay higher prices for our hospitals, the rest of the world doesn't benefit for that, from that. When we invest a lot of money in drugs, the rest of the world benefits from that investment. So an important question in this whole dynamic is, are US patients in effect- Subsidizing research and development. In effect, are we as a country basically footing a lot of the bill for investment in drugs that go on to benefit much of the rest of the world? And the answer is yes, that is so, what's happening. So would you say that innovation is at odds with affordability? It, no, not, I don't think we could ever say that because we get other things out of, uh, as we just said, there are these offsets. Uh, and those offsets that we're talking about are just in the healthcare system. If you're cured of hepatitis C, it is true over time, if you were going to be eligible for a liver transplant, you would not need a liver transplant. That is a form of savings. But much more broadly, if people are healthier, they're more productive, uh, and we all benefit from that as a society. So I, I, I don't think we can say that, uh, that those two things are at odds. I yeah, want to get, get in here. I think it's from an economics perspective, there's just making something cheaper and making it more cost effective. And I do think, I think that's the premium we're paying for in the US healthcare system is we're putting a real premium on, on innovation. And you know, we, we're obsessed with technology in this country. And the world is too, but not the way we are. So we're a very consumer-driven society. We love our innovation. We always want the next best thing, and we have to pay for it. That's the, the yeah. struggle. And the, the alternative is, and that the difference is between all those other countries in the US is what? Those are all government-run healthcare systems. Yeah. We are not. So that's really the price, that's really the differentiator. Or at least behind the pricing question. is government uh, to some directed extent, yeah. to some degree. But I think I think you can be more cost effective in the innovation. I think that's where the value-based pricing comes in, not just for drugs, but across the system. And as the first panel alluded to, that's the purpose. Some of that was in ACA and, and obviously macro was sort of the, the whole push to, to reform the system away from volume and over to value. But I, th I think you can be more cost effective in the way that if, if personalized medicine, and I may j be jumping ahead in your questions, but if personalized medicine is the goal of trying to marry up the right treatment for the right patient at the right time, then if that's, if that's truly where we're going, where the science is heading, then we have to marry up how that payment goes against that too. So if you had a, a product that was expensive, but it was only given to the patients for whom that product was gonna have the most efficacy and the most impact, then it would be more effective, right? So you're not giving it to pay, you're not wasting that. Op the opportunity cost is, is lowered because you're not using that drug inappropriately or taking a risk with using it in patients to whom they're not going to respond and using it in those patients that are. So you avoid the cost of first and second line therapies that aren't successful. Right. So in the end of the, but you have to expand your time horizon over which you look at the value uh, proposition of those products, which is a challenge because we're a quarterly, you know, whether it's the insurance company, whether it's the, Every, you know, and whether it's the drug companies, whether it's the PBMs, they're all sort of driven by this quarterly, and I'm not criticizing that, that's just what we've, that's what we've accepted in the US healthcare market. They're driven by quarterly profit earnings. Um, so you have to accept some of that, you know, what comes with that, if that's how we're going to pursue our healthcare system. Do patients understand how to navigate this landscape? 
In most cases, absolutely not. I think the system is so very complex. And we talk to hundreds of patients each and every week at Allergy and Asthma Network. And, and they don't understand. They don't understand why drug prices continue to go up, why their premiums continue to go up, why their hospital costs continue to go up. And, and they're confused. Again, you, you listen to the media reports, and you hear the list price of, of drugs that last year, if you were on a copay plan, you were paying $20 out of pocket. Right. This year, you've switched to a high deductible plan, and you're paying $600. How can that possibly be? You know, patients, again, were never intended to pay that list price. And, and we understand that. We're trying to educate the public around that. And yet, the com complexity of the system, all of the middlemen, is just overwhelming for patients. Uh, and they turn a deaf ear because it, it's just too complicated. Right, so you, you mentioned middlemen. So drug fa manufacturers retain only about 63% of the drugs list price mm -hmm. after negotiations with the PBMs, rebates, et cetera. The, the middlemen play a critical role here, and yet public awareness about that is va basically non-existent, would you say? Absolutely, I mean, when you look at Fortune 500's top list of companies here in the US, Three of the PBMs are in the top 20. How can that be? I mean, we don't know those names. As general Americans who are out buying our, our medications and seeing our physicians trying to take care of our health, we don't know those names. We don't know what value they add to the chain. And we certainly don't realize that they get over 30% of every dollar. Susan, your thoughts on middlemen? Well, as or we know, <laughs> uh, our whole system, our capital system, is riddled with middlemen, right? right? And a lot of savings in various industries come about when you cut out the middlemen. One of the big innovations Walmart brought to the market for generics was essentially cutting out the middlemen by buying en masse, and therefore it was able to bring generics to market for a $4 a charge which was below a dollar below the typical five dollar copay that people had at the time. So, could we do things? If the question is, could we do things in the system to lessen the take that the middlemen have? Of course, we could do that. It would be a question of exerting some pressure, some market pressure in the system to do that. That's one area where I think some of the innovations coming about now in value based contracting. Mm -hmm. uh, could get us down that road because these are direct contracts struck between payers and manufacturers. Uh, and in effect, the role of the middleman becomes less if there's a direct contract struck between these two parties. And, and that's sort of the question about how value-based pricing fits into the broader mm -hmm. healthcare landscape, which is moving away from paying for volume and, and moving towards prioritizing value, right, Alan? Yeah. So, so how do you see how do you see this being of a piece with that? Well, I th so I think what's happening, and I I, I don't I'm not a pharmacoeconomist, uh, so I don't I can only speculate based on what I've read and just sort of using common sense. I am trained as a political economist, which is the worst kind of economist. Just so you know. <laughs> uh, but it, if if what if precision medicine is driving discovery, whether and it's not just in drugs, right? It's in other areas of medicine too. But it really means that you have a smaller and smaller population that you're serving with that product. And, and what we know just based on basic microeconomics, the smaller the market for a particular product, especially when you have fixed costs for the R&D and the development to get and the, the, you know, the clinical trial process or whatever the approval process is to get that to market, that if the, your population that you can serve with that product is smaller and smaller, everything is starting to become like what we see in the, the rare disease market where yeah. all the, everything is expensive. But I think the, the trick, though, is to make that more affordable is, and this is the benefit of precision medicine, that same product that might work in a small subset of the breast cancer population may also work in a small set of the you know, MS population because it's driven by some sort of genomic marker, some characteristic of the genetic composition of the drug that may be true in other disease areas. And that gets you from a product that's serving 5,000 patients up to 25 or 300, you know, up to sort of that blockbuster status of two or 300 or $400,000. That's where the price is gonna to start to come down. So we just don't have a system that's designed to really accommodate that type of approach to medicine. So I don't want to be too bleak, but of course that's you know economics is the dismal science, so you have to you have to be bleak about everything. But the, I think the point is though, with with precision medicine, to marry those two things up, you have to really um, you have to marry up what's the what's the best most appropriate treatment for a particular patient based on their unique 
characteristics and preferences, and then put that at risk, right? And that's the whole idea behind right. bundled payment and population-based payments, is that you're putting some risk into making sure that you've done that properly. And if it works, you should be rewarded for it, right? If, and that's true of the medical, you know, that's the whole idea behind uh, value-based pricing across the system, not just in drug pricing or in, say, a bundled payment around the treatment for breast cancer, you know, breast cancer surgery or, uh, uh, you know, uh, maternity care, those types mm -hmm. of bundled payment designs. The, the idea is that if you, if you provide the right care and you get better outcomes, you get more rewarded. Um, so that sort of incentivizes you to make sure that you find what is the right care for that patient and deliver it to them. If you, make them, if you don't, you're going to lose, you know, in a double shot at sided model, you're going to lose some money by choosing wrongly, right? So that's the, the idea of value-based pricing. It incentivizes, maximizes the incentive to try to make sure that you're not wasting time and effort giving people products that aren't going to work. Um, but that's, a, that's not how our system was designed. Yeah. And to your point earlier about patients, can they navigate the system? The patient, the system was never designed for patients to navigate it. Not at all. It was designed for patients to, to sit there and be told what to do. And what? now we're changing that completely, which is great. We should change that. But now you're taking, ripping the Band-Aid off and you're exposing it to more and more information, more and more transparency right. around the cost. But we haven't, the system's not really designed to do that. I don't know we could say that the system was designed. I think the system <laughs> just right, happened. Right, that right. might be even generous. <laughs> right, it's sort of that. Rube Goldberg, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. What, what, should the system, what should the system be doing to better enfranchise patients at this particular moment, Tanya? Well, I, I think that, again, we've seen some of the reform that certainly helps to ensure that the right patient gets the right treatment at mm -hmm. the right time. Certainly, some, you know, we need certain policies that um, accelerate innovation to the market. Um, but we also need policy that protect the most vulnerable in our society. We need to be sure that patients are able to access the care that they need at the time that they need it. Um, it's heartbreaking to talk with families who literally are, are making the choice between food on their table yeah. or their child's asthma inhaler. That should not be the case. And so I, I think that we have to uh, continue to push the envelope on accessibility and affordability. And we have to look at, at ways to continue to refine the system to make sure that we can get the care that we need. Do you, I mean, how hopeful are you that we're moving in that direction given the, like, I'll just be euphemistic and say confusion around health insurance at this moment in time? I think it's challenging. I don't think there are easy answers. I think if there were easy answers, we would have already solved it. Are, so. Susan, are the stakeholders at least cooperating with each other in this picture? I think, I think if, again, if we go back to the area of value-based contracting, yeah. where you have a, a payer and a manufacturer getting together to talk about their common goals. What are their common goals? Payers, notwithstanding the popular belief, payers really do want to get the right cures, right drugs to the right patient at the right time, mm -hmm. right? So they have an interest in doing that. That is their job that, as they see it. Uh, manufacturers obviously are making these products to benefit people. Right? So the question is, what construct can you put around that that ensures that you get the right drug to the right patient at the right time at a price that those two can agree on and under other arrangements that they can agree on? So when you have a system where the manufacturer, by nature of the contract, is incentivized to make sure that the right patients and only the right patients get, get the drug, that they are adherent to the drug, so they take extra steps to do that, that they do a lot of monitoring. A lot of these contracts are built on heavy, heavy yeah. uh, aggregation and monitoring of data. And then you agree if all these terms are met, certain prices are met or discounts or rebates exchange hands or what have you. I mean, that is movement toward a greater element of sanity than we have in the market currently. Now, these contracts are complicated. Uh, it is hard to imagine that with 45 new active substances coming online every year, we're going to be able to get contracts around all of these. So it's not a panacea. And it obviously doesn't help with many other aspects of drug pricing that people are concerned about. For example, uh, generic drugs that don't have competitor products that prices get raised around. So again, not a panacea, doesn't fix everything. Is it movement in the right direction? Yes. Well, to that end, though, you mentioned data and monitoring. Is there enough administrative support at present to do this right? 
I mean, it's, it's, it's a much bigger infrastructure that's necessitated here in value-based pricing. Well, it, it takes heavy investment. We Now, as a country, we've made some very serious investments over the past decade in electronic health records. Yeah. And we, so we've got ability now to extract lots of data. We have to work on the interoperability piece of EHRs. But we were collecting a lot of clinical data uh, in a digitized form. So it is, it is more uh, possible now to garner the kind of data that we would need to see to ensure that outcomes are being met. Um, does that make it easy? No, it's right. a big investment to undertake even that degree of monitoring. Go ahead, I think there, if you think about getting to the data monitoring point, the, the, and this is a point made on the first panel, is that there's only so much you can learn from the clinical trial process, right? So a lot of what, especially in this precision medicine environment, where there may be some things you don't know about the mechanism of action of the product, how it may work in other disease areas. So there's a lot that needs to be rethought and is happening right now in the clinical trial market. But then there's that same sort of thinking and redesign needs to happen sort of in the post-market environment too. Um, so we need to be better tracking and setting up a system, system for patient reported outcomes and real world evidence that will help us understand what the variation is in different product benefits. And that's what you want to incentivize, right? So you want to try to figure out what is the variable in benefit to different patients based on different characteristics. And then you pay according to you know, how much benefit is being derived for that patient, how well you're hitting the mark against matching up you know, the, the right treatment. Not, and again, it doesn't work if you just do this in one piece, like if you just do it for surgery, mm -hmm. but not for other things. You really have to apply the same approach to how you price things and incentivize things across the system. So if you're gonna do it one place, you have to do it in all. But I, I think it's not, I can envision a, play, a world that is not too expensive to collect the data if you put it in the hands of the patients and let them deliver the data. So that they're, you know, you don't have the providers doing the chart extractions and, you know, doing all the data, the data warehousing and the data collection, because that's very expensive to have someone who makes that, you know, who costs yeah. that much to be sitting down at their computer and doing data crunching or paying people to do lots of data entry is a very expensive proposition for the system. Now, you get better data, that's true. So we have to sort of figure out how, you know, robustness versus, you know, real world data, there's, a, there's an issue there. But I think that is the cheaper path, is having the data, at least to some extent, about how well, a pro how well a treatment paradigm is doing for a particular patient has to come in some part from the patient's own experience. And I'm not talking about the hospitality set of things, like how nicely were you treated at the, uh, at the reception desk. That's important to patients, I don't, and how much free parking you got. Those are important things. I don't want to minimize them. But also the, the treatment benefit, right, and how do patients assess that, as well as the side effects. You know, what, what side effects did that patient experience and when and how were those managed? Um, so when you start to collect those types of data and then you pay, you incentivize the system to reward when you manage the, when you meet patients' expectations better and make sure you're giving them the right treatment that matches up with the variable benefit that you'd expect from different treatments, that's going to be a more cost effective. I don't know that it's necessarily going to make it cheaper, but at right. least it'll be more cost, cost effective. effective. So we'll get better va value doesn't mean it's going to be cheaper. It just means it should be, you'll get a better value. That's a, that's a sort of banner money. headline from right. this. Right. Value doesn't necessarily mean cheaper. If you want cheaper, you got to go government. I mean, there's a solution there that I don't, Although that we've American, been skirting around. The American public <laughs> right. thinks that value, value means, means right. cheaper. Yeah. We've been right. trained right. to think that value means yeah. cheaper, and that is another behavior that may need to be changed. On that note, I want to go to our audience. We have just a couple minutes for questions. If you want to raise your hand, we have mics traveling in the audience. Just let us know who you are. Uh, okay, right up here. Uh, John Rother with the National Coalition on Healthcare. Uh, excellent discussion, but I want to raise some inconvenient facts. Uh, number one, uh, the concept of value implies a steady price, but the industry practice is to raise prices on a regular basis uh, every year uh, with no discernible change in value. So that seems inconsistent. Number two, I think it's true that the value to each individual patient would vary and that implies that a price might vary. Mm. Uh, that's going to be very difficult mm -hmm. not to have a standard price. Number three, uh, many drugs do not cure. Uh, they simply extend, in some cases extend suffering. And uh, that's difficult to measure what value means. And then number, uh, many more, but last <laughs> one here. Uh, I challenge the idea that we are paying for innovation for the rest of the world. Really what we're paying for is marketing, which uh, is much more expensive in the US than research and development, and the rest of the world does not permit that kind of expenditure. 
So when we pay a very exorbitant price for drugs, we're really paying for marketing costs, not R&D. Su Susan, can I, let's start with the last piece, because I think you know, there are a lot of variables when you talk about value. The R&D, the innovation versus affordability, affordability question that's being brought up here. I mean, and, and the stats from MSK, we're, we're, we in the US are paying more to these drug companies than other Western countries. And, and that amount is substantially more than what they're spending on R&D. So the, that money is going somewhere else. Right. Where does marketing right. fit in but, here? But, and I deeply respect my dear friend John Rother here. I will say, companies do spend on R&D, and they do spend on marketing, right? And we know we are paying the highest prices. So, but we're, so we're subsidizing both. Right now, you can argue: Would we be happier if we were paying less for marketing? That's a fair argument to have. But we know we are paying for R and D, right? It's just ipso facto. So, uh, but I guess the question that we always have to come back to is: What's the alternative, right? What's the alternative? Do we want to go to a more regulated pricing regime, as many other countries have done? We could do that as a nation. Uh, we could do. We could have a system of reference pricing, which most of the European countries have. Do we understand fully what the impact of that would be? No, we don't know what the impact of that would be. Is it at least theoretically possible that the impact would be that there would be less innovation? Of course, it's theoretically possible, right? So this is the question mm -hmm. that we face, uh, and I don't think anybody has the answers. Yeah, I would, and just to respond to one of your other points, John, I think you hit the nail on the head for several of the big challenges to shifting to this idea of paying for value. I think it's the right approach, but I, again, we're not, it, it's a long way to go to get there, and we haven't set up a, we're using old technology in a lot of ways to try, and now we're trying to sort of lay a new payment model incentive on top of it. But I think to your point about you know, having set prices, I think that is sort of the, the payment design model, is that you would get a certain amount to manage just like what the insurance companies have to deal with now. You have a set budget to use to manage against an entire population. Now the individual price in a value-based model, you would get a set, at least in some of them, there's all sorts of different constructs, but at least in some of them, you would get a set price to manage a certain group of population based on some you know, criteria. And then the, for each individual patient, what you pay and how you allocate against that budget would vary based on, you know, so it would allow you to vary what you spend on patients, but still have sort of a standard price, if you will, for what you're getting paid to manage that entire population. So there, there are some ways to get around that, but that is one of the big challenges, is how do you, you know, there's a reason fee-for-service has been around for a long time. It, transactionally, it's an easy method to try to figure out what you owe and to pay. Um, it's not it doesn't incentivize the right thing, because what you want to pay for is outcomes and value. Right. But that's a challenging thing to get at, because value truly is, you can either define it and say, this is value for every breast cancer patient, and sort of set a benchmark. Or the reality is value is going to vary from patient to patient. How much pain and suffering they're willing to handle, what their treatment benefit is that they want, is going to vary. So inherently, the idea of value is it's, going to be sort of like beauty. It's, it's in the eye of the well, beholder. It's elastic. Yeah. Value is elastic. Uh, OK, one more question back here. Oh, hi. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Frederick Stein. I'm with the um, AACOM. Um, I'm a fourth year medical student who's about to start a residency in pediatrics. And so this is really important to me because if I know what the right drugs are for my patients, but my patients can't afford those drugs, uh, that turns into a major treatment issue. And I kind of wanted to get a little bit more to what Alan was talking about. And it's kind of a twofold question. One, how do we ensure that uh, value is patient-centered, uh, that we're actually empowering the patient to define what value is, since you said value is in the eye of the beholder. And while we're tinkering with all of this and trying to figure out the right thing, and the government's trying to figure it out too, um, how do we protect the patient? Because when it all comes down to it, that's the person we're working for. Let me, let me start with you, Tanya, and then we'll make right. our way down, and we have to be yes, succinct, my succinct. friend. Yes. So, uh, well, I, I think first and foremost, it's around awareness and education. We, as patients, we are, we must be more actively engaged in understanding our health care and understanding how we can access care, um, certainly connecting with patient support groups and with advocacy organizations, with manufacturers that have programs. Patients care about minimizing out-of-pocket expense. That's what's most important to patients. So for you as a provider to ensure that your patients are connected and supported in that way is critically important and to ensure that they get the care they need. 
Alan? Yeah, I, uh, so to your first question, how do you ensure patient-centeredness? I think that really gets to the idea of making sure that every treatment decision and every care decision starts with a conversation about what matters to patients and so that you understand what is their preference sensitivity around key dimensions, cost, side effects, and benefits. And then you can use you know, sort of decision support tools and other evidence-based tools to try to marry up all right, what are the available options to you based on what you've told me are your, your preferences and what is the evidence support? Um, but this is where value-based pricing can come in, right? So I've got a, and precision medicine will suggest there's probably gonna be a range of options that may deal with certain preferences better than others. And you have to make a choice about what it is that you're gonna, you know, what is the, where do you think you're gonna get the maximum benefit for that patient based on what they've told you is important to them? And then you put money at risk to achieve those goals on the part of the patient. You know, the system's already putting practices and providers and hospitals at risk, right, in these value-based models. It, everybody needs to be put at that same kind of risk. Now, whether it's one-sided or two-sided and all that is a whole convoluted, co you said brevity, which is why you went to her first in a second. <laughs> so I'll stop there, but it's, it, that's the question of the day, really, is how do, you, how do you make this work for patients so that it's a better, the value proposition is because healthcare is so personal to the individual. When you're sitting down in front of your physician or your nurse practitioner, your PA, mm -hmm. and you're talking about your cancer, it is your cancer. It is so personal yeah. to you. So to think about that there's some standard, your, your life is worth some standard amount, all that stuff, or that you should think about the price to the system, you know, well, that's why I have insurance. I mean, so this is a really complicated thing to start to get that. And this is why we've set up a system yeah. to where patients don't have to well, think about those I things. think the very fact that we're focused so much on the patient experience yeah. and the patient enfranchisement in the system is fundamentally a sign of progress, yes, right? And on that point. attempt to leave us on a high note, yeah. I have to conclude the panel. But thank you to thank you. all of you for your thoughts and wisdom. And thank you thank to you, you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, Tanya, Alan, and thank you, Alex. Next up, we're going to welcome three health policy experts for a conversation about the role of regulation in the drug marketplace. So for that, please welcome FDA Commissioner Andrew Von Eschenbach, Amy Comstock-Rick, CEO of the Food and Drug Law Institute, and Gerard Anderson, health economist at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And back to lead the conversation, my colleague, Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large for The Atlantic. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. I got a lot of questions about my socks earlier, and I'm wearing them because they were my holiday present from Margaret Lowe. I just want to confess that, so thank you, Margaret. You look like President Bush. Exactly. Well, I want to, I want to uh, thank So now we're here to talk about the role of regulation, the role of government. You know, earlier in the first panel, uh, I asked some of the panelists who, who the bad guys were. Uh, in, the, in the pricing world and figuring out how to get this right. And I don't want to point fingers here, but here we have the person responsible for the Medicare payment system, the hospitals. We have a former commissioner of the FDA. And we have someone who's been a really, really wonderful patient rights advocate. So maybe you two are the ones that uh, we'll uh, take are responsible. responsible. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. I, I, but, but, but Andy, let me start for you with a minute on, on this broad question of the role of regulation. Because I know when you were at the FDA, you were a huge advocate for reforming uh, critical paths, trying to find different things. And, and I guess, you know, as someone who's a closet libertarian, I always ask myself when we talk about regulation, do we really need regulation? So what is your answer to that, having come out of the GOP world and, and I think kind of roll back the regulatory, what's the right equilibrium when it comes to the public interest in getting the, the, the drug pricing world right? Well, we need good regulation. And who <laughs> determines that? <laughs> Well, what determines that is how successful it is in being able to accelerate our ability to bring new products, life-saving products, mm -hmm. uh, to patients, while at the same time assuring that they're going to be safe. Do you think the effective. system is broken today? No, I think the system is in need of modernization, mm -hmm. and it needs to continue to respond to the enormous changes that are occurring around us in science and technology, in the world of globalization. And regulatory capacity and regulatory policy needs to keep pace with those changes. So it has served us extraordinarily well. And the Food and Drug Administration has been the world's gold standard for over 100 years. But it needs to evolve just as the world's evolving. So there is the need for us to re-examine uh, policy and to modify it and change it as we need. Um, Jerry, I'm, I'm going to jump to Jerry for a second because you're also part of the sculpting the, the public policy or the public architecture uh, in Medicare and thinking about these. 
If, if you were to do what you did in the 80s and 90s today uh, and reform the system, what would you do? What would be some of the big lift items you would take on? So I think the biggest one is if you think about the Medicare DRG system, it is essentially is a bundled payment system where we took all the services that the hospitals provided and put them into one single payment. And what we're seeing now is we're bundling more and more services together, hospitals, physicians, home health services into bundled payments for knees and for hips. But what's not included in these bundled payments are typically pharmaceuticals. And I think the idea of putting pharmaceuticals into a bundled payment is something whose time has come. Do pharmaceuticals want to be bundled? Well, I don't know about the drugs themselves, but oh. the companies um, <laughs> are essentially uh, interested in this concept. I mean, we heard, hear about value-based pricing, and the question is, who should determine the value? Um, and, and there's really a number of choices. You could have the PBMs or the PDPs making the choices, who, and they're making a lot of the choices today about value. But I actually have much more confidence in the physician and the patient making those choices. So in a bundled payment world, the, 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 the choice of which drug to use would go to the physician or to the hospital as opposed to the PDP or PBM. And for me, that's just a better decision point. I want my doctor deciding which drug I get, not my PDP. Amy, I'm interested in how you see the sort of the, the, the pricing life of drugs. I know you're at the Food and Drug Law Institute, and you're not in an advocacy position, but you've got a good purview, a good perch looking at this. And, you know, there have been some of the issues that have come up are high launch prices for, for drugs, you know, patent terms and patent protections and where those uh, ought to be done, the generic um, mm -hmm. the backlog, if you will. And, and, and again, you know, so that this morning can be consequential, I'm sort of interested in people who would say, how would you shift it? What needs to change to actually get to a healthier pricing system than we have today, if you agree that it's problematic today? Well, I'm going to start with, I think, one of the problems is it's so complicated. And, and there Quoting is... Quoting Donald it, Trump. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew it was so complicated? Yeah. Um, but the, it's interesting because the simple answer is the FDA, as we've discussed already this morning, does not regulate the price of drugs. But there are so many regulations and laws that impact, significantly impact the price of drugs, that you really need to look at the totality of it. And all those regulations have a goal or a purpose that is not directly, direct, is not pricing. But so you have to balance, though, and still look at the purpose of those regs. For example, um, the generic drug system. Let's face it, drug pricing competition has a lot to do with drug pricing. Mm -hmm. And so the backlog and the time it takes for two generics to get through, should we prioritize that, is one question. The issue about um, how much uh, communication industry can have with payers in terms of marketing, which I know was discussed at the prior panel. Uh, there are limitations for safety reasons on what industry, pharmaceutical companies so, can so, communicate. But it, just quick, there's a lot of issues right now on communications on off-label use. Mm -hmm. but. The latest number I've heard is 40% of prescriptions are off-label. So providers sometimes are limited as well as payers in getting information on off-label use. So on that, I just want to, mm -hmm. on, on that communications issue, it, it seems to me that that is a very hard issue for the public to weigh in one way or another. And, and one of the interesting things that I worry about when I, when I hear about equations like this is, is, is the nanny state challenge, right? Is there so much concern so that what becomes the oversight, the corrective to wanting to regulate everything or to preempt that? And if, and if the concern is so-called safety, I tell you, on the same stage, we've had a lot of conversations in here with various parts of the healthcare system, more on the use of data when it comes to HIPAA. And you can look at those, those groups in HIPAA on, on, on information sharing and control, and you can either make the case that they're trying to preserve their incumbent place in, in business as opposed to the public benefits that might come from more sharing. You can, you can be on either side, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm interested in who makes the other side on the information case, that if there was more uh, communication on pricing early on with payers, 
and efficacy of the drugs, right? Well, part of yeah. it is if you're going to get a value-based system, you have to know what's happening, It's right? not just communication on pricing. It's communication on data that the manufacturer may have mm. about uh, the, the value of the drug beyond what the label approves it for. Mm -hmm. But there's a real spectrum here. I come from a general principle that better decisions are made when you have more information. Mm. I mean, that's, that's pretty simplistic. But communication, there's a full spectrum. There's direct-to-consumer advertising. Do we actually want manufacturers? to be able to advertise for a, a use that isn't approved by FDA? No. I think most mm. people agree on that. And, and then there's data, yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry, clinical trial data given to payers so right. that they can make better decisions. Those are, they're all different scenarios which have, you have to balance the benefit from the risk. Andy, I saw you object. Yeah, well, I, I think for me, I, I, I would like to step back for a second um, because I, maybe not in this forum, but in many places where this conversation is occurring, there's tremendous confusion between price and cost, and they get, those terms get used interchangeably. And I think we need to really draw a bright line between price and cost as it relates to the FDA. In my opinion, the FDA should have zero, no role whatsoever in determining the price of a drug or any medical product. However, the FDA does and can play an important role in influencing the cost that goes in to those drugs. So, as so can, can we make this real for people? And let's use the yeah. example of EpiPen. Well, let's make it real from the point of view of following up on Amy's uh -huh. uh, point. And that is, if one looks at drug development right. across its entire spectrum, there are a number of places along that road where the FDA can intervene with appropriate regulatory policy mm -hmm. that can reduce the cost. Mm -hmm. a simple example to bring it home, if you look at the um, 21st Century Cures Act, enabling the FDA to use biomarkers um, mm -hmm. more in the regulatory decision-making process, which could reduce the risk of failure, et cetera, et cetera, that translates into cost reduction for the developer. And Jerry and I were talking, and I'd like him to chime in, is could you then, if you reduced cost by regulatory policy, by greater extract, certainty on the research side. By an acceleration of, of bringing it to market with greater patent protection. It's, there are many things we could talk about. But then the question is, can you link that to the reduction of mm -hmm. price? And, and Jerry has some... <laughs> so typically, you, you, you can't. I mean, the drug companies absolutely need a huge amount of money to do R&D. But at the same time, they don't typically price a specific drug based upon the amount of R&D that they invested in that particular drug. Um, so, you know, I think there is a relationship, but it's not, a, it's at, at the corporate level, it's not at the individual drug level in terms of pricing. In terms, a, a slightly bigger issue, if you wanted to step back, mm. is who's responsible in the federal government for this whole issue of drug pricing? I mean, the FDA has a small role and doesn't really want one. Uh, CMS has a role, but has given a lot of it to the PDPs. You have the VA with a significant role. You have DOD, the Public Health Service. There isn't anyone in the federal government whose responsibility is it to worry about the prices for drugs, either just that the federal government buys, maybe what the Medicaid program does and not the consumer buy. So if I was Donald Trump or somebody and I was saying, who's it responsible in the federal government for drug pricing? I don't know where I would turn. And I think that's a serious problem. Fascinating circle. Amy, we were talking a little bit about patents as well. And I know there's been a lot of talk about whether or not the current patent terms that are provided, which I think are 12 years, whether those are too long and need to be brought down in order to, to, to create uh, more pathways for earlier generics, I guess, to, to, to bring, down, bring down prices. Is that a healthy way to look at this? And I was also intrigued with, with Gail Walensky's comment earlier, which coming from someone who was an avowed Republican, I was surprised by, because she was basically advocating a picking winners and losers kind of approach to that if there is a monopolist out there that's misbehaving, that the government could in fact come in and weigh in and actually pump up the rival, which sounded fascinating to me and no one 
reacted, I, I think, as much as I, I'd be surprised by. But Andy, what, well, let's start with Amy. Yeah. And then Amy. Well, I think you really, again, with regulation and law, lumping right. them together, you have to figure out what's your goal. And the goal of exclusivity is to promote innovation, to right. incentivize the companies to do the R&D in the tough areas. So let's it's 12 years it. right? I actually, it depends. You get a guaranteed, for an orphan drug, you get a, and for, for under Hatch-Waxman, you get a guaranteed period of exclusivity. Mm. And that, in, in theory, as far, you know, it seems to incentivize companies. So I'm not sure shortening it is what you want to do. But that, but the monopoly does, and the lack of regulation does allow the price to go higher. And I, really is, what is it we want to control? There's about 40 moving parts at least mm. here, and we do have to prioritize. And, so and to Andy, me, actually, yeah. sorry, Andy, so as, where a, would the as a government former patient advocate, you don't want to disincentivize innovation. Mm. So I'll give you a real world example of, of the point that you were raising uh, with Gail Walensky. Back in 2006, when we were faced with uh, bird flu, H5N1, mm. We only had two licensed uh, vaccine manufacturers in the country. In order to create capacity, FDA took a very proactive stance mm -hmm. of going out, engaging with companies, and helping them to be able to meet good manufacturing practices, et cetera, so that they would be able to come back into the manufacturing of vaccines. So it wasn't necessarily going out and paying somebody to create an alternative to the monopoly. It was nurturing the ability for companies to come in and engage by helping them adapt to the regulatory requirements that were going to be necessary. And then we wound up with five uh, companies, as I recall, and that translated into us being able to really meet needs for uh, seasonal influenza. Mm -hmm. So my point is, at FDA, as a regulator can play an extremely important role in facilitating the ability for companies to participate in the marketplace. And that then translates into more competition and lower prices. So, Jerry, does that work for you? Well, yeah. I mean, you, you've said that if, we've, if we did value-based pricing with water, no one could afford water and lots of people would die because right. the value is so high. I mean, sort of, I've, I'm intrigued by that comment it's sort of haunting me right now as I was Drinking water in the other room. <laughs> exactly. Well, so happy I, mean, I don't yeah, have. So if you paid it on the base of value, we're we're you know we're mostly and it water. Absurd, we couldn't exist it, without. It may sound absurd to people, but you know the other the other you know the mm -hmm. the, the natural logic to your logic is, would you then organize the healthcare industry as, as you would a utility? So to go to your your question about uh, patents and all, all those issues, I mean if you look at the history of patent law, it was from 1790 that essentially was one of the first laws that Congress passed was patent law, and it was set for the length of two indentured servants. And that's essentially what we have n now slightly modified. So it has nothing to do with, phar the length has nothing to do with pharmaceuticals, Microsoft, everybody has the same essential patent law. And then we have some additional market exclusivity periods in the, in the program. If, if you do it from an economist's point of view, it makes absolutely no sense. Mm. Uh, because you know somebody like Gilead has made so much money on it in the first two or three years that they, and they didn't actually manuf uh, develop the drug, they essentially purchased the drug. So that doesn't make a lot of sense from an economist's point of view. But if you take a broader view of the system, it does make sense because you've got to give them some idea of how long are they going to have a time period for exclusivity? And if you tailor to each product, whatever, no one would know how long they would have to have a market exclusivity period. So some regularity is important. But from an economist's point of view, if you just want to incentivize somebody, you essentially say, as Gail Walensky would do, or somebody, give them three times their investment or some number like that, and that would be a sufficient incentive. But that would just be so hard to implement. But then How? it's even hard to pinpoint what the investment is. Is it the exactly. investment in that yeah. drug, or do, what about the failed right. drugs? No, no, you'd have yeah. to do it in all of the drugs, but right. nevertheless, it would still be a very hard thing to do. So, do you, do you guys think in this climate, you know, I hate to go back to the debate over the Affordable Care Act and others, but, but for those of us that are lay people outside looking at it, it, it does look like a complete mess. 
it, it does look like if the Atlantic were a hospital or a healthcare provider or an insurer, I mean, it would be a really convulsive uh, environment in which to sort of look at. And I'm interested in, in those, I mean, you've all been involved with this a long time. What do your crystal balls say to you when you see the trends now and how, how to get some of these issues right? Do you think it's possible to get any of this right and in a healthier place in this environment? Amy? I think we have to. I think there's been a but fair amount. But there's have to and will or, or I, likely it, to or well, probability. The way the whole, what, what we've all been talking about up here is that it's many moving parts. And I think there will be efforts to tweak and improve some of the different moving parts. I don't know that there will be a holistic approach. And I don't think there is will or ability right now for that. Um, but. But I think there will be movement. And I think one piece I, I mentioned earlier, off-label use, there's a lot of litigation going mm. on right now on uh, First Amendment rights that corporations have to communicate truthful and, mis and non-misleading information about mm. their products. And that the courts may influence this a little bit, too. Again, it's only one or two of the many moving parts. So I think there are two areas which we really got to focus on. One is generic drugs where there are no comp there's no competition or maybe one competitor. And what are we going to do in those cases? I mean, we're all aware of the Dara Prims and all those situations. Uh, Maryland just passed legislation last week essentially talking about price gouging um, and essentially said unconscionable price increases are, are subject to civil money penalties. So that's an area that we've got to take a look at is the whole issue of generic drugs and take a look at the FTC's role in this and a whole variety of other things. And I've been testifying in Congress about uh, limited distribution networks or in limited distribution chains where the, the drug companies keep another drug company from getting access to the drug so they can't demonstrate bioequivalence. The other area is the whole issue of the specialty drugs, uh, which are so expensive. And here, I think it's going to come down to an area of access. The Senate Finance Committee did a study uh, looking at the sort of the model that Gilead had for uh, Hep C drugs, and they decided that uh, Gilead decided that only about 15 to 20 percent of the population that get gets the access, should get access to this drug according to their 15 profit. 15 to 20 percent of the population that needs it? That, that needs it. And this is a drug that is essentially almost a complete cure for an infectious disease. Mm. But the pricing model that Gilead operates said 15 to 20 percent is our profit maximizing point. So we're going to have to, as policymakers, come up with a way to get an infectious disease to everyone, mm. but still maintaining the same level of revenue for Gilead, because you, know, you still want them to invest in those things. So the challenge is not the profit maximizing model of 15 to 20 percent people, but 100 percent of the people getting these drugs. Andy? Well, there, uh, just two quick points I mean, uh, in terms of you're asking uh, what our level of optimism is. First of all, what we saw on the discovery development end of the continuum, uh, the 21st century cures legislation, which was bipartisan, mm. which really showed that we can, in fact, come together to address a challenge. As far as the delivery end of the spectrum, I think one of the most disruptive things in a positive way that's occurring is the influx of information technologies. Our ability to now acquire, aggregate, and analyze data with regard to what is actually happening in populations with regard to drugs and medical interventions, and then manage those populations in a more rational way. So we're getting the right treatment to the right person, getting the right outcome. That creates a completely different model of um, the Deming model of reducing variance Mm -hmm. around the mean, which improves quality and drives out cost by virtue of eliminating waste. And FDA modeled that some time ago, even looking at the use of a blood thinner, Coumadin, and if you could use a genetic test and be able to do that more, not perfectly, but improve the dosing, you get rid of underdosing with clots and strokes and overdosing with bleeding, and you reduce the net cost associated with the healthcare. So I'm optimistic because tools are emerging that are going to allow us to manage this system uh, of healthcare delivery 
in a much more rational way. Just before I go to the audience, I want to ask a question about the FDA. Um, I don't know the, the current FDA commissioner, but Peggy Hamburg, when she was there, often uh, appeared and talked to us. And you had the sense that um, there was this ongoing challenge to sort of do what you were doing when, when you were commissioner, which is to streamline, to modernize, that the system is old, that the laws that empowered the FDA and its purview were there. My, our first run-in with Heather Bresch was not over EpiPen, was over you know, her concern then that, that drugs that were made outside the United States were inspected and tested differently than those made inside the United States. Mm -hmm. And so led this charge to try to get more FDA inspectors and raise fees from industry to sort of help pay for that. And it was controversial with the FDA. The FDA did not like it uh, at that time and, and, and came in. And you have this sense, and, and I, my apologies to everyone in the FDA, but it's out of ignorance, is that it was slightly creaky, that it had to be changed, that it had to be filtered, that some of the things that was... And so I just want to give you all a, a, just a short chance. If you were to change anything in the FDA and how it operated and inter interacted on, on these patient-based you know, issues with industry, what would you shift and change beyond the 21st Century Cures Act, Andy? We're going to make you head of it. <laughs> well, the, the most important issue is resources. And by that, I just don't mean financial capital. I mean intellectual capital. Mm -hmm. The, the agency really needs the ability to be able to bring into the agency the kind of intellectual capital and talent that is really going to meet the kind of challenges you just described. And I think that's always been an important issue. You think that's likely in this environment? I think it's essential. And I think that there is enlightenment around mm -hmm. that, but it has to be actualized. But I, for me, as an advocate for the FDA, and it, it, it is absolutely stunningly amazing or institution made up of stunningly amazing people. We just need more of them and they need to be supported and nurtured in a much more appropriate way because they have the capacity to address these challenges and these problems. Amy? Yeah, I'll say ditto to that. And then two additional quick points. One is um, to your earlier question about is there interest in really attacking the whole problem. At Scott Gottlieb's confirmation hearing, where I was two weeks ago, I guess, um, Senator Sanders asked him about drug pricing. And he did, he, maybe it wasn't the appropriate place to talk about blowing up the whole thing. But his answer was very narrow, is mm -hmm. that he would prioritize complex generics. And again, we've all agreed generics would help. But it wasn't. He didn't say Congress needs to look at this. And so I, I found that interesting. He actually. would prioritize in terms of pricing? No, I'm or, sorry, or in terms of pathways, speeding through speeding the through approval of I complex see. generics. And then the other issue, which again is far beyond drug pricing that I would um, have FDA prioritize, is the issue of communication on off-label. Going to the, Andy's point about data, if we have more real-world world evidence that manufacturers gather and analyze, talking about what can happen, who can talk about that data and to whom. Um, there were some recent guidances that came out, I won't go into detail about them, that are a small step in that direction, but they don't even talk about what providers can learn from manufacturers mm -hmm. that's beyond what's on the label of the drug. FDA currently really limits the exchange of information for some really good mm. reasons. But I think it's time for a new look at that. It's a new age. That's where Jerry. And I, I would agree with what all has been said. And just to add one more thing, um, last two weeks ago, I was testifying in government operations. And Janet Woodcock was also testifying with me at the, from the FDA. And what we were talking about are these limited distribution networks. And this is stuff that Martin Shkreli has taken advantage of. They essentially don't allow another generic drug company to get access to the drug in order to copy it, in order to provide uh, tests for bioequivalence. Mm. And so essentially, they maintain their monopoly in that way. And she said, and I can't do anything about that. And if I were to do one thing, give her one additional piece of authority, it would be to do something about the fact that there isn't an ability for them to make those drugs available when somebody like Martin Shkreli doesn't allow them to be copied. Fascinating. Let me open up the floor to comments and questions. Thank all of you for a really great, yes, in the very back. Um, my name is Sabah I'm from the Association of Clinical Research Organizations. And I know all of you said that the FDA doesn't directly set prices, but the um, user fees are being reauthorized right now, and they contain real-world evidence using surrogate endpoint and um, patient experience data provisions. Do you think that'll affect prices? And my other add-on question to that is, 
our president wants to increase user fees that the manufacturers pay out, do you think that'll affect drug prices? So I think, let me take the last question. Um, I think it will, in fact, affect drug prices, mostly in the generic market, because if I'm a manufacturer of generic drugs and there's already two manufacturers in the, in the generic market and it's very expensive for me to get FDA approval, I'm less likely to enter the market. So my concern is, is the, in the generic space. In the brand space, there is so much money to be made if you have a successful drug that an extra million or $5 million is, doesn't matter. But in the generic space, it's very important. Other questions? Can I just add yeah, something please, to that? Andy. Well, one other thing that uh, I think you'll see occur is we're moving much more to a horizontal understanding of the impact of these drugs on various disease states based on an underlying mechanism. And if the FDA can move to the point where it's approving based on mechanism of action rather than clinical indication, mm -hmm. that changes the um, market structure for that particular drug. So there may be more patients that are able to, be, to access that. Uh, and that involves a change in label based on real world evidence. And so what you see then is a different macroeconomics of they can lower price because they have more volume. And that's, and as Jerry was pointing out, we have to work with the industry to get those kinds of trade-offs right. If they just keep the price up here and have more volume, that doesn't help. There's got to be the ability to balance that. Great. Other questions, comments? Let me just finish with one last one that I'm going to frame badly. Um, I'm interested in, in the, this we, issue. We won't answer it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, but yeah, hopefully you won't. But, but I mean, a lot of the things that, that you hear when you when you talk to folks in the drug industry and in the in the production side, the research side, is that there are flops out there. We've heard stories today about about um, products and, and and therapies and drugs that get near the end, get canceled, that the cost, the R&D side, Jerry, you were laying this out, are very high. And it reminds me in a weird way of the movie industry, you know, where you're at Paramount Pictures and you may have a lot of Star Trek films, but not everything's gonna, you know, hit, uh, or, or your, you know, what, th that there are some blockbusters that come in and sub certainly they kind of subsidize the flops or the subsidize the things that don't go through. And, and, but another way of not thinking of just flops if things don't go through are other needed diseases. Like in the rare disease arena, the, the R&D and return side for a lot of the therapies that are being developed in, in sort of the less lesser known but important therapies. And I'm wondering whether there's some sort of quid pro quo that can be done there, that where there's greater understanding of when, we, when we hear about something like Gilead, but, but you know, there's, there's greater investment in some of these other sidelines, which I know uh, even our sponsor today and others are, are into, but don't get the attention and whether that's a missing part of the discussion. And I think it's a huge missing part of the discussion. And I think there are some drug companies that have done a very good job in, in going after certain orphan diseases and taking care of those, um, even though they sort of know that it's not going to be terribly... And then pricing them in a, in a, in a, a re responsible way that isn't... That, well, that, that has, you know. has worked in the past and is not working so well now. Mm -hmm. So we were just talking, one of my colleagues at Johns Hopkins was talking about a drug that's exceedingly expensive, $450,000, $750,000. And we're just wondering, who can afford a drug that's 450 or 750,000? It's only for 6,000 kids. And so you, you need a very high price in order to invest in it. But who in society can afford $750,000 for Amy, this drug? Um, I was just going to say that um, I think we've done some excellent things with law and regulation to promote innovation in areas of orphan drug, orphan mm. disease, for example. But there is significant unmet medical need in this country in areas, diseases that are much larger. We heard about Alzheimer's mm. this morning. I used to work in the field of Parkinson's. Uh, significant unmet medical need in areas mm. with diseases that are not orphan. And there are serious questions, a whole other session mm. for another day, about whether our current system, which basically is neutral um, or agnostic on whether companies should prioritize one area or another, and whether as a country we should be prioritizing 
Alzheimer's? Or should we pri be prioritizing R&D and innovation in areas Like we that are cancer or something. Even, yeah, but even yeah. then, that's a lot of private go, no-go choices mm -hmm. made by, the, by industry. And should we be pushing them a little harder the way they did with the orphan disease? Final word, Andy? Well, I just come back to an earlier theme. I mean, there's a in general sense that somehow or other there's an adver adversarial relationship between the FDA and industry. And frankly, there are some political forces who would prefer that it even be more adversarial. Mm. In fact, it really needs to be much more collaborative. The, the opportunity that the FDA has to work in a collaborative way with industry to get it right. And in getting it right, they, one, have a much higher probability of success. And two, they can fail early. And so they don't waste a lot of money taking drugs so far down the line only to find out that then they're not going to mat, meet regulatory expectations and requirements. So what I would hope for is a change in culture and a, a larger political uh, atmosphere of allowing a more collaborative relationship between the regulator and the industry to improve success, and in consequences of doing that, we ought to be able to reduce price. And on that word, Andy, while you haven't left me with lots of hope, you've left me with just a little bit of hope uh, on that. So let me, let's give a big round of applause to Jerry Anderson, Amy Comstock, Rick, and Andrew Von Eschenbach. Really great discussion. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, Amy, Gerard, Andy, uh, and Amy. Um, this has been a rich conversation about a, a complex and critical challenge or series of challenges, issues that we will be following in the months and years ahead very closely. I think uh, I just want to remember the quote that, um, that uh, uh, Alan Bulch, uh, the patient advocate, said, uh, which I think captured it for many of us, despite all the complexity of all of this, uh, he said, healthcare is so personal. And I don't think that there's a person in this room that would or could disagree with that. Uh, I do want to once again thank uh, our underwriter, Eli Lilly and company, for making today's conversation possible. Thank you to our speakers and to Alex and to Steve for leading the conversations. And mostly, I do want to thank everybody in the room for uh, being with us here today. You gave us your time. That's a very precious commodity these days. Before you go, I have one small request. There are copies in the room of a quick survey. Uh, you'll also get an email from me. If you could fill it out, it will only take you a few minutes, I promise, and your feedback is vital to us. Uh, and after that, you're free to go. Thank you so, so much for being with us. <laughs>